so we are just outside of Norfolk, Virginia, and today we're going to be covering a battle that doesn't really get a whole lot of recognition. And a lot of times it's referred to as Virginia's version of Bunker Hill. And this very spot would be the Patriots' first victory here in Virginia. And that battle is the Battle of Great Bridge. So we've made our way down a boardwalk to what they have here called a marsh overlook. And it's essentially giving you a layout of the land as it would have appeared in 1775. Now over in this general direction, right here, you see some modern day structures. That is the general vicinity in which the Battle of Great Bridge would have taken place. The British would have had Fort Murray up in this general direction and the Americans would have had their breastworks and stockades uh, off to the south in this general direction. And there was a small uh, bridge before the modern day bridge there, obviously. It is at that location where the battle would take place in what was called Virginia's version of Bunker Hill. So, as you can see here, we are here at the Visitor Center, and the Marsh Overlook was right here, and the site of Fort Murray is just north of our current location, protecting the causeway. Well, the Americans realized the importance of this position as well, and they would establish breastworks on the south side of the bridge. So, to give you a brief backstory on the events leading to the Battle of Great Bridge, shortly after the battles of Lexington and Concord, Virginia's governor, Lord Dunmore, would order the Patriot stores of powder be seized in Williamsburg, Virginia. Well, obviously this didn't sit well with a lot of colonists in the area, and Lord Dunmore would not only retreat to Norfolk, he would actually repay to replace that powder. Shortly after arriving in Norfolk, he began to raise an army. Uh, mostly loyalist Tory militias, and he had a few companies of British regulars and grenadiers. Now, we are just outside of Norfolk, and as you saw earlier looking over the marsh, this is a very marshy and wet area, but there was one causeway right here that was vital, not only to be resupplied, but for the area's commerce as well. Well, Dunmore, realizing how important this area was, would dispatch his troops uh, just north of the Great Bridge Causeway and construct Fort Murray. And here you have an example of what Fort Murray would have looked like. Nothing special, just a stockade fort, but uh, it commanded a uh, very crucial position here at the Great Bridge Causeway. So this is something that's interesting. On November 15th, 1775, the day after his success in routing the rebels at Kemp's Landing, Lord Dunmore issued a proclamation declaring martial law and offering freedom to any indentured servant or slave willing to bear arms for His Majesty's troops. Well, he would obviously garner a lot of attention and he would establish Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian Regiment and their uniforms would read Liberty to Slaves. And they were stationed here at Fort Murray and actually freed slaves fought on the side of the Americans as well. Welcome to the site of the first land battle of the American Revolution in Virginia in America's first victory. Interesting. What a cool little nugget that is. So we mentioned the Americans began to arrive a few days before the battle, realizing the importance of this area. So they would arrive on December 7th. And they began constructing breastworks and other field fortifications in and around this area. Well, on December 9th, the British would roll out two two-pound cannons and begin shelling the American positions. Now, the Americans not really thinking anything of it. They thought it was just harassing fire. They didn't really call to arms or man their positions until they saw a red column leaving Fort Murray and advancing across the bridge here. Now leading that British assault was an elite unit called the Grenadiers and they were from the 14th Regiment of Foot and they were commanded by Charles Fordyce. Now the Grenadiers were known as the Colonial Shock Troops. They were tall, big and strong and they had to be to be able to throw the iron grenades of that time. They would also wear really tall hats to make their appearance even taller and more intimidating. So you can imagine being an untrained militiaman manning your breastworks and then all of a sudden the strongest army in the world is advancing with its shock troops at the point of the spear. So like we just stated, the Great Bridge battlefield happened right here in this general area. Now, for reference, there's my wife. They built us this. So we're gonna use this as a reference because I am huge on visual aids. So we are marching as if we are the British Grenadiers leading the assault. Now, something different happened during this attack. Now, you gotta think, at this time in the war, 1775, 
The American military, or lack thereof, had literally no experience, and its militia units had even less experience and little to no structure. So they didn't really have any discipline. So imagine British grenadiers advancing on your position. But something weird happened. The militiamen didn't fire. They held their fire. Now, you heard the quote from Bunker Hill, don't fire until they see the whites of their eyes. Well, that's what happened here. Now, when the British were within 50 yards, the Americans finally opened up with devastating volleys, tearing hot lead through the British ranks, and they would suffer some pretty heavy casualties. Now, something else to remember is you're an attacking force crossing a bridge. A bridge is only so wide, so when the British were advancing across this narrow bridge, they can only have six soldiers across, which meant you had a really tightly packed formation, and it was easy pickings for the American militia here. Now, I hopped over to the American perspective here, and pretend we're behind some breastworks here, and the British are marching across this narrow bridge, six men abreast. And just to give you a snapshot of how intense the fighting was here, both commanders on the British side, Captain Charles Fordyce and Lieutenant John Batut, were both wounded here within the first opening volleys. Now, despite his wound, Fordyce would rise and yell, the day is our own. The British again charged. Several reached the Patriot Works before being shot down. Among the dead was Fordyce, and after his rally and quote, he would uh, succumb to his wounds. Now, the battle here would last less than an hour, and by the time it was over, the British had lost more than 100 men killed or wounded. And on the Patriot side, one soldier was wounded on the hand. So this was an overwhelming victory for the Patriots here. So here's another sign I wanted to share with you here. And this quote up at the top, I then saw the horrors of war in perfection, worse than can be imagined. 10 and 12 bullets throw, many limbs broken in two or three places. Good God, what a sight. And that was said by Captain Richard Kidler Meade of the South Hampton District, 2nd Virginia Regiment. So we mentioned how African Americans here served on both sides, and this is dedicated to Private William Billy Flora, who is a free black man from Portsmouth, and uh, he was on sentry duty when the British began advancing across the bridge. Despite the danger, he stopped firing his musket eight times at the advancing force, and even removed a plank here to slow down the enemy's advance. Now he'd survived the war, and he would serve in the 15th and 16th Virginia regiments here, and even fought in the final battle of Yorktown, which is nearby. So that was the battle for the most part, and they have a few more things inside the visitor center and museum here. So let's go inside and see what awaits us. Oh man, this is a pretty cool room. So what we're seeing here is kind of like an interactive exhibit. Uh, they have like these uh, holographic images, and oh, that's cool. Here's the grenadiers marching across the uh, Great Bridge here, like we touched on earlier. They were six across. You can see that they would probably make pretty easy targets for forces behind uh, breastworks there, but you can see their tall hats to make them more intimidating. And we'll pan back over to the colonial side. And right on cue, the screen goes off. All right. Okay, oh, here we go. Grenadiers press forward across the bridge. They form up into two platoons and fire at Billy Flora. Now, if you don't remember who Billy Flora was, he was the African-American who began firing by himself and trying to rip up planks of the bridge uh, by himself. And here is some... Um, uh, some of the garb that a standard militiaman of that time would have been wearing. You can kind of see they didn't really have a standard uniform. And an example of the musket they would have been carrying. This is a flintlock musket. And it was a smoothbore barrel. And it fired a round projectile. And it wasn't really accurate past 50 yards. And you can put a bayonet right on the end of it there. And just to give you an example of the rounds it would have fired. You had your lead balls there. And right here, that's your piece of flint, hence the name flintlock. You would squeeze the trigger, that hammer would come forward, and the flint would create a spark, igniting the powder in the pan there. And pan back over to the British side here. This is pretty cool. It looks like a regimental flag, along with your standard British red coat and uh, the weapons there. I mean, that's it's just a really cool flag to see. Let's see what we can find here. So this is the 14th Regiment of Foot uh, buttons and regimental flag as you can see here and here's an officer sword that would have been carried at the time along with a powder horn that would carry your powder and you can see some of the uh, different kinds of projectiles in the back there and of course the famed British red coat there that is so synonymous with the American Revolution so I hop back over to the American side and this is the smoothbore musket we just looked at but right next to it I almost missed this is an example 
of a rifled musket. Now, these were also commonly used by American forces, but there's some differences here. So at the end, you can kind of see the barrel isn't perfectly round. It's kind of grooved, and that allowed the ball inside to spin and essentially gave it greater accuracy. Now, there is a downfall to this. It was really hard to reload, and you couldn't put a bayonet on the end of it like you can on the smoothbore musket there. You can see in the background. So we mentioned earlier in the video that the British would wheel two two-pound cannons forward and begin bombarding the American breastworks. Well, right here is an example of a two-pound cannon. And although it looks really small, it does pack a pretty decent punch. So again, the British would wheel two of these forward and begin bombarding the American breastworks, essentially kicking off the Battle of Great Bridge here. But yeah, that's a pretty cool visual to see. So all in all, this is a pretty neat museum, and it's brand new. And I'm going to be honest with you, I had no idea that this battle even existed or any of this was here until I stumbled across it on Google Maps. So it just goes to show you, you never really know what you're going to find on your vacations here. The Battle of Great Bridge is one of those battles you don't really hear a whole lot about, but it was the Americans' first victory in Virginia during the American Revolution. I hope this video was able to shed some light on that and on the actions of Billy Flora. And like I always say, we're going to catch you on the next one.